Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Alright, let's bring on tonight's guest. If you listened to last week's show, you'll remember that John Barrett came on and told us about the dogman encounter he had in an abandoned house. There are several questions for John I have that I didn't have time to ask him. He also had another experience he hasn't shared with us yet, so I'm glad to welcome him back to the show. John, thanks for coming back. Thanks for welcoming me back. Good to be here. Oh, it's great having you. John, for the listeners who haven't had time to listen to last week's show yet, please tell them about yourself. No problem. Well, I'm 28 years old. I grew up in a small town called Pauling, New York. I still live there today. It's in uh, Dutchess County. It's in the Hudson Valley. It's a very heavily wooded area. I spend a lot of my time outside gardening, doing some landscaping, a lot of walking, a lot of photography. I work about five days a week doing gardening and landscaping. I've been doing that for about three and a half years. I have a girlfriend named Haley. We've been together for about eight years, hoping to uh, step up the game, move out of here, and possibly get married. So I have some plans. I like to collect films. I collect insects and breed tarantulas and scorpions and other things like that. So I'm definitely a big nature buff. That's pretty much how I like to spend a lot of my time, and that's pretty much me. Be honest now, did you cry when they killed Shalib in the Two Towers, Lord of the Rings, or what? A little bit, only because I am definitely more of a fan. I was personally kind of hoping that Samwise would be a victim. I always liked him. I remember when it first happened, I was like, oh no, I never read the book. So I definitely was, I remember being a little bit worried. Wow, you must love spiders if you're hoping for Samwise to get killed. I'd say you do. On last week's show, you told us about the dog man you and Haley ran into in that abandoned house. Did Haley ever blame you for what happened that night? Not exactly. I remember talking to her about it recently, and she agreed that it was basically both of our ideas to go back. Because I did feel bad. I, I didn't want to put her in any danger myself. I mean, I shouldn't put myself in danger either, but it was my idea to go back, but she was definitely very willing and she seemed to be enlightened by the whole experience as well. At least she didn't blame you. If she did blame you for it, yeah, that wouldn't be good. No. Speaking of going back, you said your two friends had explored the house before they took you and Haley there. Did you tell them about what happened to you and Haley right after you had that experience so they'd know better than to go back and possibly have an encounter of their own? I didn't tell them what happened. I figured they wouldn't believe us, so... We didn't want to raise too much speculation, so we did tell them, though, that there was nothing really there when we went. There was nothing exciting. We didn't find anything of value. No reason for them to really want to go back. So we did try to dissuade them. However, we didn't really give them any detail. Since you didn't tell them what really happened to you, didn't you worry that they might go back there not knowing the potential danger of doing so? Well, I did think about that for actually quite a while. Luckily, they weren't as big of an explorer as we were. They seemed to take what we said for what it was. But now, luckily or unluckily, the house isn't there any longer. We've been back, I want to say, a year past this incident. We drove past, and uh, the house was no longer there. And a couple houses adjacent were also torn down. It kind of makes you wonder why they tore that house down. It does. It does make you think. Yeah, it does. You said on last week's show that Haley never saw the dog man. Does she seem to have an easier time getting over that experience since, unlike you, she never saw it? 
It definitely seems like she's a lot more at ease with this whole experience. When I talk about it, when she talks about it, it's a big difference. You know, I seem to stutter a little bit more. I'm definitely a little more anxious about the topic. She gets almost excited. Not like she wants it to happen again or see it again, because she still gets the same anxiety, but it's just not as intense. But she's definitely not as affected, it seems. Other than that, or she's very much possibly more brave than I, so. Well, she definitely sounds like a trooper the way you describe her, so gotta give her a lot of credit for that. That is true. When you two were running from it, did it ever make any vocalizations? When we were running from it, no. It seemed to have stopped right when it had climbed up into the second story. Yeah, it was creepy enough. If it would have made vocalizations while you're trying to get away from it, that would have just made it so much worse and harder to deal with. Thank goodness. Absolutely. I would have ran much faster. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you would have. Let's move on to the second experience you had. Before you tell us about that second experience, though, please tell us about the place where it happened. For the second experience, it was actually at my home, where I'm also currently living today. The setting is very similar to where the first sighting happened, where we have somewhat close neighbors. The closest neighbor is across the street. However, to the left and right, there aren't very many close neighbors. Maybe a quarter mile to the right, there's a neighbor. And you can't even really see the closest house when you look to the left when you walk out my door. So it's pretty rural. It's also set into the woods. There's forest as far as you can see. There's also an abandoned railroad that goes miles both ways past my house. A lot of kids go quadding down there. People go walking. It's now the uh, rail trail. So they're building a fence down the middle of it, and people are beginning to walk down it, which is kind of a bummer. I kind of like their uh, secluded little area. So the house is mostly surrounded by oaks, maples, pines, a lot of shrubs. It's very, very dense. So as we don't get a lot of sunlight where we are. We have a lot of trails that we built when I was a child surrounding all the forestry and everything. So there's a lot of ways to get around. So it's very flat on the top of our yard and where the road is, but our house is kind of set on a hill. And past our house is where the forest is. And there's a trail that leads down to a large garden area where we tend to hang out. It's very private. There's places to sit down. There's lawn chairs. There's a barrel where sometimes we'll have fires. Our house is also pretty much right on the road. So we park right in front of the house. And that's pretty much the setting of the entire house. All right. Now that you've told us about your property, please tell us about that second experience. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. So a few weeks after our encounter, we decided to have a few friends over at the house. We invited, I want to say, four good buddies over. We were going to just sit around the fire and break up some pallets that we had laying around and just talk and laugh like we usually did. We tried to do this every weekend, but as we got older, the gatherings kind of faded. So we gathered a bunch of lawn chairs up, sat around the fire, broke up a bunch of pallets, and I called my friends over. Slowly they arrived one over one. It was getting to be around dusk, so I'm guessing around 8 p.m. The timing I'm not positive on. So while we had my buddies over, we were just laughing, kind of getting a little buzzed. I remember one of my buddies was getting obnoxiously loud, and he was talking about the new Transformers movie that was coming out and getting pretty amped up about it. And... I remember going up into the house a couple of times to check on burgers and hot dogs. and It was just your standard gathering, nothing fancy. So as we're sitting there, we're having a lot of fun, getting loud. The forest starts flashing. There's a lot of light emitting from the trail cam that my dad has set up out there. It's going, it's flickering pretty brightly, and it's going one, two, three, four, maybe 15 to 16 flashes. So it took a lot of photos. And we didn't think too much of it. I quieted down. I know Haley quieted down. It wasn't necessarily out of concern, more curiosity. Then we started hearing the growling, that same exact low, long, guttural growl. And it started low. We started hearing a few twigs snap here and there. 
and they were pretty loud twig snapping. They were very, it was like loud crack sounds. And then you'd hear that growling again. You'd hear a little rustling in the leaves, a deep, deep growl. I remember my friends looking at each other like with a smile at first. Like, what is that? You know, like, ooh, you know, kind of making fun of the situation for a brief second. The camera had stopped flashing at this point, so I figured it had walked past it closer to us at this point. And as I mentioned, the camera is maybe 150, 100 feet away. I, I don't remember at this point. It's been moved. It wasn't very far at all. And we keep hearing it. It gets a little louder. It seemed to change the direction at one point. We didn't hear the rustling. We didn't hear the snapping as if it were going to the other point. But you can still hear that it's now way off kind of behind us and we're like surrounded by woods so it completely changed direction and we didn't hear where it was originally making any noise anymore so that was a little strange and it kept growling kept growling my friends began to get nervous and my friend pete who is the most crazy one of us all he was you know very obnoxious very large kid the kid wore a kilt he was a metal head you know he was really into it he loved punk music i do as well but, you know, he was really into it. I remember he was wearing the kilt that night because he figured, oh, we're going out drinking. Let's, you know, have fun. <laughs> so these are the kids I hung out with. They were just characters. And I remember he was like, I'm going to go out there and fight it. You know, he's just joking. And we're like, yeah, okay, Pete, go out there and fight the monster, you know. And he keeps making noise, keeps making noise. And I remember he hunkered down and he looked at us. You know, he looked at me and Haley. He goes, why don't we go inside? Yeah, that's probably a good idea, Pete. Let's go inside. So we all started folding up the chairs. A couple of them weren't pulled up, so we stacked them. And we brought the other ones up inside. It definitely scared us to a point where we all went inside. I mean, these were four guys, well, five guys, including me and Haley. And these were adventurous dudes. They did not want anything to do with it. Even they agreed it sounded very large. It did not sound like it was walking on four legs. Yet again, when it walked, it was ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. And when it did maneuver through the woods, there were very dense trees. It would move through them. You can hear and see the trees off in the distance because the fire would have a glow. You could see a bit of a rattle in the trees, but we did not see anything. But it was there. It was interested, and I was convinced that it was the same animal from what we heard from that night. Because I still have yet again to hear that type of growl, that type of persistence from any mammal. Usually, my experience, if you come up on any type of animal, it generally freezes still, then runs away, or just runs away. I wasn't very used to that. Neither of my friends, which half if not most, were outdoorsmen themselves. So, yeah, we all left. We went inside. I remember a couple of my friends didn't even stick around much. They wanted to leave the ones who weren't drinking and the ones I forced to stay over. They wanted to go home, but they had been drinking a bit. And at this point, it was getting late. It wasn't super late. It was maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock by the time, you know, all the commotion had started. But I remember talking to my friend Pete about it this week, in fact, about this incident. He very well remembers in detail. and He even reminded me about a couple things. So it was quite an experience. Yeah, it sounds like it. Before, during, or after you were growled at, did you ever detect any strange smells? Yet again, just like the first experience, to my memory, I don't remember any smells. And I did ask my friend Pete that as well. He didn't remember any smells. He did remember a couple of friends that I didn't remember who was there that night. One of them was uh, Jesus. Another friend was Tim. So I'm going to reach out to them and see if they remember. Well, eyewitnesses don't always detect smells when they have an encounter, so there's no reason to think that you would have had a strange smell lingering around. Had anything happened around your property out of the norm that might have tipped you off that a large, strange creature might have been hanging around before you were growled at that night? On that day or even weeks prior, no, I had no clue or even a vibe that something was off. Well, that's all right. He might have just shown up that night for the first time. It's hard to say. When you and Haley heard that growling, did she seem to instantly recognize it from your first experience? Yes, she immediately, when we went inside was when she mentioned it, when we were all regrouped and everything. 
she pulled me aside into the kitchen and she was saying, was that the same sound? Because she was like, I'm shaking. This time she was much more nervous than the first encounter. This is when I actually saw it, you know, in her face that she was definitely affected by it. I definitely believe that she also believed that's what it was. Did she ever tell you why she was more upset after that second experience than she was the first time you had an encounter? I never directly asked her, but I assumed it was the same reason as me. I felt that it had followed us home or something. We never really talked about it in detail, but we kind of just said it when we looked at each other. Yeah, that makes sense. It's one thing to have an encounter someplace away from home, but when something like that follows you home, that's when it gets real, really quick. Absolutely. It became terrifying from one to two seconds immediately. Oh, I bet it did. What did your friends think it was that growled at you like that? They thought it was a big animal. They weren't too convinced that it was anything out of the ordinary, but they weren't exactly willing to stick around. Pete might have been showboating for a brief moment, but I saw deep down he definitely did not want to investigate. But I don't think they were too convinced it was anything other than what we have normally in our area. I didn't bring up what happened, the uh, first encounter to them, so I don't know. They did find it strange, because I remember that when we were talking inside the house, I remember Pete and Tim were talking about how it was very strange that it wasn't one area and not the other in a second, and they wondered if there was more than one. So they noticed that there were strange things, but they were guessing what kind of animal it was. I mean, they were a little drunk. But I haven't talked to them since that night about it. I actually rarely see these people, maybe every six months or so. As we get older, we definitely grew apart. Yeah, that's the way it normally goes. How far did you say that abandoned house was from your home? I want to say about 40 minutes, 45 minutes is about right, with traffic a good hour as possible. So it wasn't exactly right around the corner, but it wasn't exactly across the state either. No, it was pretty close. Too close for comfort. Is it accurate to say that even though you and Haley knew what it was growling at you that night, you didn't want to accept the possibility that the dogman from your first encounter had actually followed you home? We didn't want to accept it, but we were convinced. I'm, I'm still convinced. Since I've been camping in my yard with friends and whatnot, we still hear animals, and I've yet to hear that, and I still think about it once in a while, especially when I'm outside. And as I've mentioned, I won't go outside alone. It sticks with me. Well, I'm sure it does. Something like that will tend to stick with you, so that's no surprise. To address the skeptics out there, living in rural New York the way you two have for so many years, I'm sure you know what a bear's growl sounds like. Do you think the growl you and your friends heard that night could have possibly been made by a bear? I really don't think so. I mean, anything is possible. I always like to remain a skeptic. It's how you get to the truth. But I really, really don't think so. I've heard bear. I've heard coyotes. I've heard a lot of different large animals to dogs, you know, everything. We've had three to four instances where we've had bear and at least one of which where I've heard him growling myself and it just didn't sound quite like that. It was much more of a short, drawn out, like hump sounds. And it seemed to be almost like an exhausting sound, you know, like bears just seem to be much different. The coyotes are much more high pitched. Even their growls aren't as deep as this or as loud. I don't know. I'm definitely myself. I'm not convinced that it was any of those. Yeah, you would know. With all of your time living out there in the woods, you would definitely know. Is your dad an outdoorsman? If so, what does he think about your experiences? Well, he thinks it is possible, but he's not looking into it. He kind of sees things for what it is. He says if he sees it one day, then that's another thing. But he believes also, I believe, that I believe what I saw. He's definitely a hardcore outdoorsman. I mean, he's been doing metal detecting for almost 25 years, 30 years. He's really out in the sticks sometimes, looking for old camps, looking for old baseball fields, anything where people used to hang out. And he's a fisherman. He's a hunter. I mean, this guy, he's all about it. He claims he's never seen anything like this. And I've poked him. I've prodded him. I've really asked him. 
But um, he's not the most open individual. He could be, you know, maybe just doesn't want to talk about something he's seen. Because you had that second experience while you were on your own property, did you have a harder time dealing with it? Or did you have a harder time dealing with your first encounter because you saw the dog man that came after you? I definitely had a harder time dealing with this second encounter because now I feel that maybe it had followed me home or maybe it has a particular interest in me or Haley or both. Did I anger this animal thing? I, I don't. It gave me a certain unsettling feeling, like no matter how fast you go, will this thing still be able to track me down? What what are its intentions, if so? The first time, there was more of an adrenaline, much more of an excitement to it, that sort of element. But this one stuck with me on a more disturbing level. Well, I can understand why it would. Have any other strange things happened to you at your property since that night when you were growled at? Since that night, nothing that I can really point out. It's pretty quiet, apart from some crazy neighbors going at it once in a while, like right across the street. Sometimes they'll fight. Nothing out of the ordinary. Well, that's good. Maybe he's moved on. At least I hope he has. I hope so. You said you live in the woods now, in a remote area. What kinds of problems has that caused you now that you know dogmen are a reality? Well, I'm definitely... 10 times more cautious about going outdoors. I do know that now, you know, I wasn't attacked. I have to rethink about this experience as an experience, you know, well, I wasn't attacked. So I, I have been trying to recently, since discovering your show, to revert how I feel about it. But it, it's hard for me to go outside at night. It's definitely hard to talk about it at times. Sometimes it's easier to talk to the public or people you don't know than it is to talk about it with your family and friends that do know you. But I don't go outside at night without company. Really, I don't go outside in the day without somebody accompanying me. It's just an unnerving feeling. And sometimes I'm not even directly thinking about it, but I'll be standing in my doorway going, Haley, come on, let's go. You know, we got to walk the dog or we got to do so-and-so, let the ducks out of the pen and she gets what I mean, you know, she she knows that I don't want to go outside alone. And it sounds kind of lame in a way, but it definitely has had that much of an impact. But it's funny, people who know me are like, John, you're afraid of the dark. It's crazy, you know, like this guy who plays with the most venomous animals, really crazy spiders and scorpions, and I love heights and all that, and you're afraid of the dark. I don't get it. So it's definitely affected that. Well, they can feel that way, but they've never had a dog man encounter. No. <laughs> That's right. Do you think there's ever going to be a time when you can act the way you used to in the woods before you had that first encounter? I think so. I really do. I see that coming soon. I do see it because after watching your show, I am starting to learn that it may just be another species that just kind of wants to be left alone, maybe wants to make its point, you know, kind of like a rattlesnake it will make its stand. And these are animals that I love. So I'm trying to have a different understanding towards them and have a little less fear because, like I said, I wasn't attacked, and I read that most people aren't attacked. They are scared within an inch of their lives in many cases, but I'm trying to go about it a different approach. And like I've also mentioned, I do feel slightly special in the sense that I've seen you know, something that most people don't see. So I'm trying to have a better outlook. Speaking of the attacks, the first time we spoke, you asked me if I had spoken with any eyewitnesses who were attacked by dog men. How much did it rattle you when I told you that I have? It definitely rattled me a bit, quite a bit, because I already had felt a little bit unnerved because now I felt that it could follow you. It knows where I am. It's much bigger than me. So when I hear that, at times it may be violent, it definitely shook me up. Understand that it seems to be very rare whenever a dogman does attack an eyewitness, but it does happen, so you can't rule out the possibility. Absolutely. Better safe than sorry. Oh, definitely. Yeah, in my opinion, that's always the case. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, John, but before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Just keep doing what you're doing. Since I'm new to this topic... I really want to keep 
learning more about what I've seen. And thank you for letting me speak on your show and letting me tell my story. Oh, you know, you're welcome. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on the show and telling us about those two experiences. I really do appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you, Vic. Oh, you know, you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye. Tonight's second guest is a dogman researcher who's based out of New York State. He's been on the show before several times. Dave, welcome back to the show. Hey, Vic. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming back on. You know, I appreciate it. Dave, for the listeners who haven't heard you on any of the previous shows you've done, please tell them about yourself. Well, uh, I currently live in Brazier Falls, New York. Uh, I originally grew up in Herman. I have family on both uh, Herman's side, and I got a family living up on the uh, Mohawk Reservation, or Akwazasne. Uh Currently working as a fisheries technician at uh, St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Environment Division. I just recently started getting into doing dogman research. I've been going out and trying to do as many investigations as I can do, and a couple of them I've actually had some encounters. You definitely don't let any grass grow under your feet. You do stay busy, so yeah, as always, I'm really impressed by you. Since you were in the show last time, have you had any notable experiences in the field? What have you been up to? Well, most of the time when I go down, uh, I've done a couple daytime after work. I just go down, drive down to a coffee road, and I'll pull off and listen around the woods. Usually it's fairly active with wildlife during the day. Uh, there's a couple notable days I've gone down there. I've taken a walk around on my grandfather's. Most of the time, it's quite active. I hear tons of birds, see deer, and there's a couple times I went down that was just completely quiet. There's no wildlife around. Didn't hear any insects. There's no deer, not even any deer sign, not, nothing fresh. It's basically a walking into a graveyard. But most recently, uh, I've had, I'd say, two encounters, one of which I had a friend with me. One of them was actually pretty terrifying, nonetheless. Well, if you don't mind, tell us about those recent experiences. Well, the most recent experience, actually, well, I'll start off with the less terrifying one, and I'll move on. The first one was actually just a couple weekends ago we went bullhead fishing again because it's that time of the year when we don't want to go out and start fishing uh, in our favorite hole, which happened to be where we experienced one of the uh, dogmen last year. Um, well, we went down about 8 o'clock at night. Uh, we literally just arrived there at 8 o'clock. Uh, I finished work, and, of course, my roommate, he was off, so he figured that we'd go do some bullhead fishing that night. So we went down, uh, got to our hole, got all of our stuff situated around, threw our lines in, and it was still light out at the time. I mean, the sun was still cresting the horizon. It was probably about half an hour before it became completely dark. And got our lines in, weren't really catching much. Once it got dark, about quarter to nine, and then we were getting some activity, we weren't catching any huge ones, we were just catching small bullhead. And at that time... Uh, we were listening to the wildlife around us. It was really noisy. You could hear all the insects. And I mean, we even had um, a couple deer that were hanging out in the, it's like a little wetland uh, near our bullhead hole. It's not really swampy, but uh, some parts are just, you know, there's a little creek that runs through it. And the water will sometimes overflow when it floods. And then it makes a couple little ponds that are temporary because they dry up in August when the dry season hits. And the deer will go over there and hang out. Well, we watched a couple of them, and of course, probably around 9.30, I would say, is when we actually started not hearing anything. It just became extremely quiet. Uh, you couldn't hear a single animal. You couldn't hear any of the insects, nothing, not even a bird. There was no bats out, and that was kind of weird because usually there's bats. Every single time it gets about 9.30 or so at the bullhead hole, you'll see bats flying around trying to eat up mosquitoes and all the moths and whatnot that are flying around. But didn't see a single thing. And no sooner than we noticed that, something growled at us over on the other side of the road. So, of course, that creeped the heck out of Alex. And he looked over and he's wondering, uh, well, I don't know what that was. And he said it wasn't any kind of animal that he's ever heard. And, of course, it sent shivers up my spine. And I immediately knew what it was. So, of course, Alex sat there pondering whether he wanted to leave or not and 
I sat there wondering, thinking, eh, well, we might start hooking into some larger bullheads soon because this is about the time that they start biting because the smaller ones, uh, they usually feed right as it gets dark and the larger ones will start coming out once the sun's completely gone. And once it's pitch black, they immediately start getting into feeding mode. We've always had luck around 9.30, quarter to 10. But Alex was getting really uneasy about it. And at the same time, I was getting uneasy about it because this was really close. I mean, over near the tree line where we heard the growl was roughly 50 yards away. And I decided to ignore it. It's like, ah, we'll just, whatever it is, we'll let it sit there in the trees. It can watch us. And of course, I got the feeling it had to have been a dog, man, because the, the way it growled, it was just a really deep uh, guttural uh, sound. Like the closest thing you could probably resemble it to would be um, like if anybody's ever seen the movie Abominable, it's it's been on sci-fi a ton of times with the weird looking Yeti in it that can apparently open its mouth up like two feet wide. Well, when it growls in the movie, that's exactly what the growl sounded like that we heard. And... For about another half an hour after we heard the growl, I kept eyeballing the tree line. And, of course, it was kind of nice that night because the full moon was out, which is kind of ironic. It was really bright. You could see through the trees, and it lit up the roadway, so I didn't have any issues seeing anything that was walking up and down the road or over near the Jeep. The only blind spot we had was where our vehicle was parked. You couldn't see anything behind it, so if something actually snuck up behind it, you wouldn't be able to see it. And we caught a couple more bullhead, uh, about 10, 15, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was about 10, 15 rolled around and we decided, eh, not any more fish that are going to bite cause we weren't getting any more bites. So he decided to leave. Oh, before we were heading to the Jeep, Alex was getting his fish taken care of. He was gutting them out. And I looked over into the tree line and the same tree that I saw last year with the dog man in it. I noticed there was a really large like black figure in the tree and it wasn't part of the tree because before when it first got dark, I had already been looking at that same tree and it wasn't there. And of course I looked at it again and lo and behold, well, there's something in the tree. So I snapped the picture of it and I sent it to you, but I'm fairly certain that was a dog man sitting up in the tree watching us. There was no real eye shine that I could see like, every once in a while I could see it. he turn his head just at the right angle where you could see the moon like the glimmer from the moon on his eyes and then it would just disappear so he was pretty good at concealing himself up in the tree and we got into the jeep and took off and we didn't see anything else the rest of that night then a couple days later we went up there and we did another drive down the road it was a little bit later that night we just randomly wanted to go out and do a, a drive we'd do it once in a while just to yeah, go around, cruise around down uh, in the Herman area because it's nice down there. And we took a drive down Coffee Road. And we were getting up to where I had the encounter, with, uh, I think it was like three years ago, the one where I saw him over in the pine forest there. We were driving in that area. And we took note of when we were driving down the road, there were sections where you would hear a ton of wildlife. You'd hear crickets. You'd see the bats flying around. You'd hear the frogs. And then there's another section where you'd hit and it just went deathly quiet again. You would not hear a single thing. And we kept driving down the road. And as we're driving down the road, once in a while, I would slow right down and, you know, I'd use the brake lights to see if there was anything behind us. And I thought I saw something on the road and we stopped and I was you know, talking to Alex and he turned around. And he was looking. You didn't see anything behind us. I looked in the mirror and I was looking around, put the window down. And I was a little bit sketched out about putting the window down because it was just so quiet. I didn't know what was going to happen. So we sat there and listened. And as we're sitting there, I could hear something walking in the leaves off to the left side of the vehicle. And it was over in the tree line. Usually you couldn't see it. And of course, it's in the pines. So it was incredibly dark. It just pitch black. So if there was anything over there, you would not see it. Unless I didn't have a flashlight. I had my phone, that was about it, but I didn't bother shining it into the trees. And I just listened to it, and it was probably 25, 30 yards out. And, of course, it just uh, it stayed in the woods and didn't do much. And we continued our drive, and I had the window down a little bit more, and I listened to it, and eventually we got up to the crest of the hill where the pine forest ends, and I didn't hear anything else. 
Uh, we got about another hundred yards down the road, and then all the wildlife started getting loud again because there was another swamp up there. And we got off Coffee Road and we drove back home. So I the third time I went down. This time I went by myself, and I drove down the road that night. And as I got over to my father's camp, that's when everything started getting quiet again. And this was before the pine forest. And I noticed that once I got up to the crest of the hill, I had my windows cracked just a little bit. And I had this really pungent smell come into the vehicle. And it was horrid. It kind of had a wet dog smell to it. But it smelled more like if you ever been around somebody that's harvested a coyote, people that shoot coyotes and sell their pelt well before they wash it they stink and that's exactly what it smelled like just old musty kind of a wet dog kind of a smell but it's mostly like a odory uh like fungal kind of a smell to it that's what i've always noticed with them but that's what it smelled like and then of course you could smell the like rotting flesh or deteriorating like muscle if something was rotting on the side of the road and, and fat and kind of like a smell of bear fat bear fat i think smells absolutely horrid as well but that's what came into the vehicle, and I mean, it made me gag when I smelled it because it was strong. I mean, it was literally like being right over top of a corpse. And once I smelt that, I stopped, and my dad's got a metal gate in front of our camp. And, of course, it goes down this uh, little driveway that he made. It's just a little white stone driveway. It's been overgrown with grass. He keeps it mowed. And there's a bale of hay that he puts out for the deer. That's just down below our camp. He puts it out every summer and out during the winter just to keep the deer fed, keeps them happy. And out near that bale, when I stopped, I looked down the road, the driveway, and I noticed something over near the bale. And I mean, it wasn't a full moon that night. It was like a crescent moon, but it was still fairly bright, surprisingly. And I could just barely see this figure over near the bale. And I wanted to get a picture of it, but I put my phone out the window and I was trying to focus in on it, but my camera sucks on my phone and it was just a black picture. You couldn't even see the bail. And I figured, well, next time I should well, I'd probably, probably better just invest in a better camera. I'd like to buy one, but the, one of the ones that I want to get is super expensive. And I also want to get a thermal imager. I mean, that would have actually been nice to get, but I had to get a new phone and I haven't been able to find one because it's this LG V30. I used to have an iPhone uh, iPhone has the FLIR 1, I think, or FLIR 2, and that's pretty good at thermal imaging camera. But anyways, I wasn't able to get a picture of it, but it stayed right behind the bale, and every once in a while I could see the head poke up and look at the Jeep once in a while. And I used the phone, my phone light, uh, shown it out the window, and of course, when he was looking at me, I could just see little glints of light from his eyes every single time he'd poke his head up and down, and it was like on intervals of like two or three seconds. And then finally, I could see the rest of him go behind the bale, and then he vanished. I didn't see him move behind the bale any further or come out from the other side, or I think he just snuck around and went back into the woods. And I wasn't going to get out of the vehicle. I mean, I was in <laughs> no mood to get out. I did not want to take my chances with it because, I mean, the bale itself, they're pretty large. The farm my dad gets them from, I mean, the bales are probably six foot tall. It was either a dog man or it could have been that Sasquatch that was hiding behind the bale. I didn't see any noticeable uh, facial features, but I mean, it was tall, whatever it was, because it was hunched over. So if it stood up behind the bale, other than when it was poking its head up, it was probably seven, eight feet tall, maybe. And I sat there for a little bit. I was trying to listen for some vocalizations and I didn't hear anything. So I figured, eh, I guess I'll take off. So I took off and that was it. The fourth experience that i had down there was i went down with alex again and this was just a night we just we wanted to go set off some fireworks because we went up to the reservation and they had a ton of fireworks for sale at bear's den and I said ah i'll take some money and blow it on some fireworks because i haven't shot off any in a while and i didn't want to wait for the fourth of july so bought a bunch of mortars uh, some rockets uh, we even got a brick and some little firecrackers that we were messing around with. And we drove up uh, about 9 o'clock, and we got on the coffee road again. And the wildlife was perfectly fine. Everything was normal. And then we got over on to, uh, about, it was about midway down the road where that sluice pipe is. There's uh, another beaver flow in that area. 
And once we got there, we figured eh, it's a good spot to set off some fireworks. So we got out of the vehicle and set up there. And we could still hear the wildlife. There's still bats flying around. So we got all of our stuff out of the trunk and we we're setting it up. And as we're setting everything up, everything just went quiet. The bats just, they were gone. They weren't flying around us anymore. The mosquitoes were still hanging around. There wasn't very many of them, but even the insects went quiet around the area. We didn't see or hear a single thing. So that really sketched me out for a second there. And I figured, ah, whatever, you know, we'll still shoot off some fireworks. So we started shooting off some mortars and they were loud as because where we were, it's like a really big open area, but it's surrounded by trees. So when you shoot off something loud, it's super, super loud because of the, the echo and, you know, being an open area, it's like having a loudspeaker. So if we've shot guns there before. And if you shoot one off, just the crack itself is loud as when you shoot it off. But we shot off like six or seven mortars and we got down to the heck was it? We were shooting off um, these rockets that I bought and they're really bright. If you shoot them off, it's not really vibrant colors like the mortars. It's mostly just a really bright, like silvery color and it shoots out these little report stars when they go off after the explosion. Well, we shot one of those up and as we shot it up, I wasn't paying attention and it went off and I looked over in the trees and when that thing went off, there were four sets of eyes over in the trees and they were literally staring right at us. When that firework went off, it just lit up the eyes and then as the light faded, the eye shine faded and that really creeped me the hell out. And of course I got Alex and I was telling him, it's like, look over the tree line. I'll set off another firework and look at that tree line. And tell me if you see any eye shine. So I set up another rocket and shot it off. And lo and behold, it went off again. And they're still looking at us. But the scary thing was they moved closer and they were probably about 150 yards out when I first saw them. And it scared the out of me because i realized oh my god you know they're moving up on us and they're, they're staying roughly in the same distance apart from each other but they're moving up and we're in different positions but they're all still closer and i decided um we might not want to set off any more fireworks well he was setting up a mortar and <laughs> he didn't realize he didn't have it in the tube all the way so he lit it and he accidentally kicked over the tube and it hadn't gone down the tube so it fell out onto the road and <laughs> the thing was about to go off. So we got back and when it went off, it was super bright. And this one gave off red and green lights. And when it did, then I could see all four of the figures crouched onto the ground next to the road. And they had moved up a lot closer. Now they're closing in around the 70 yard line, I'd say. And I said, screw it. Let's get the hell out of here. And of course I turned and Alex wasn't even near me anymore. He'd run over to the car. He was already gone. And I grabbed up the stuff off the ground. And I threw it into the trunk and I closed it. And he'd already had the car started. was getting ready to go. And it's like, what the hell are you doing? He's like, you didn't see those things? It's like, yeah, I saw them. And he's like, well, I'm ready to get the hell out of here. And he hit the gas and we were gone. I mean, we went down the road and we were flying. And this is on a dirt road. And he was probably doing 60, 70 down this road. But we were gone. There's no way we were going to stay on that road and see what was going to happen. He was absolutely scared us but that was the fourth encounter and that was the scariest one that's happened so far i'd say it was i don't blame you for reacting the way you have when dogmen have been close to you in the past but do you ever get frustrated when you pass up opportunities to get great evidence by moving away from dogmen you've encountered there's definitely some times i get frustrated like the one that was hiding behind the bale i was getting really frustrated with my phone that night i really wanted to get a picture of it and I, he literally was within the perfect place to get a picture or a video but the quality on my phone is just mediocre at best and when i was trying to zoom in on them i really wanted to get the outline i wanted to get the eye shine and everything and the camera was not picking up the bail it was basically just picking up a little bit of light from the vehicle and you could barely see the road heading to the camp and then beyond it was just pitch black and a bunch of fuzzy particles and that was about it I don't blame you for not throwing caution to the wind. Don't blame me in the least for getting out of there, but some people listening to the show, they might wonder, well, if he's a dogman researcher, why isn't he staying there and trying to get better evidence? Why is he getting out of the area? Again, I totally understand why you're doing that, but just bringing that to light that I'm sure there are plenty of people wondering that. I mean, when we were setting off the fireworks that night, I wasn't really like going to plan on investigating that night. 
because, I mean, we just went down there for fun. I don't get to really hang out with my friend very much because he's always working. He barely gets any days off. So we went down just to have some fun. Of course, there was an area where I do my investigation. So I figured, ah, eh, I guess we'll go down there. Nothing will probably happen. And that night, something happened when you don't expect it. And he shot over to the car fast. I mean, I literally, as soon as that firework went off on the road, I mean, it was the fact that I was paying attention to them and not the firework. It went off pretty close to me. So it was still enough to make your ears ring. And the flash was enough to make you see lights for a little bit. And then it finally faded away. And when I saw those figures, I mean, he obviously saw them before I did when that thing went off because the they call them reports when a mortar goes off those little smaller explosives that go off, they crackle. Those will light up the area for like two or three seconds. And when those went off, he saw them distinctly. And when he, we were actually driving back, he told me kind of a little bit of detail what they look like in terms of their color. He said, look like they're all pitch black in color. They also had like really, really fluffy hair. Like if you, like if you see a, a long haired cat, like a black long haired cat, their hair would look just like that. Uh, he didn't get any facial features. You know, they had, you know, he saw one, you know, it had a snout, but when he said that, I immediately knew it had to have been a dog man. Four of them. Alex bolted for the truck first that time, but between the two of you, who's normally most likely to run for the truck when things get hairy like that? You or Alex? Definitely him. I mean, if we had seen them before, like if I had already known they were there, I would have most likely sat and waited to see what they would do. Obviously, probably from the comfort of a vehicle, but he's not really attuned to like stuff like this, paranormal stuff, uh, cryptids. So if he hears something sketchy out in the woods or something that he knows isn't natural, he'll take off. I've been out with him a couple times, and uh, there's actually one time I took him up to Clear Pond with my father. Uh, we went for a small hike after we went bass fishing, and we heard, uh, I'm pretty sure it had to have been a Sasquatch, but it whooped two or three times out in the woods and you can hear it distinctly and when we heard it he turned tail and started walking fast back the way we came he was he was done he wanted to go back to the camp but that night he saw them i was actually surprised how fast he made it back to the vehicle because we were about 50 yards away from the vehicle and he was able to get back in a mere couple of seconds he just sprinted back and he was gone sounds like alex had an extra gear you didn't even know about Oh, definitely. Uh, he had like superhuman speed when he bolted for the car. <laughs> yeah, that's how it normally works. Was that Alex's first time seeing a dog man? That was his first time. Uh, he's actually never seen one before. He's told me about times he's seen what he thinks was Sasquatch. I think where he saw that was like over in like the Edwards area where he used to hunt with his father. But those are the only times he's actually seen something like that. Well, sounds like it made an impression on him. Oh, it did. He's pretty prone to night terrors. I mean, he has anxiety. I'm sure that night he probably didn't sleep very well. Oh, I'm sure he didn't, too. You sent a picture to me that shows what you believe is a dogman print. What more can you tell us about that print? Uh, that print I came across the other day. Um, my aunt posted it. And when she showed the picture, she said it was fairly good size. I was kind of uh, jolting her for not putting something next to it for size comparison. But she said that it was about the size of a black bear footprint. And somebody commented on it and they said, oh, it just looks like a bear print. And it's like, oh, no, that was definitely not a bear print. That's, just, that's a canine print. And when she told me how big it was, about the size of a uh, black bear's print, that immediately rung some bells. And it's like, that's a pretty large print. And I told her where she found it. And, of course, it was right next to my uh, grandmother's house where I've gotten one print, I think, two or three years ago. I took a picture of one. So that's the second time that we've had large prints like that around the house. So she obviously must have the same one that might have been living in that den years ago hanging around the house. I've got that picture posted right now in the YouTube version of tonight's show. If you take a look at that print and know anything about the woods, you'll see that's definitely no black beer print. Yep, that's definitely canine. The claws, the pad, the toes, it's definitely not a bear. I've seen plenty of bear prints out in the woods before, and that was definitely not a bear print. Oh, no doubt. 
Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Dave. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I've been seeing recently about people actually getting people to go out and try to hunt dogmen. I've seen posts of it. In fact, one of the older groups I was in, people were actually urging others to go out and actually actively hunt them. It's like, don't do it. That's just stupid. I mean, that's that's just as stupid as uh, like seeing people over in um, India or Africa when I went to get pissed at a crocodile that comes in and you know eats a couple villagers because they do it once in a while they're just animals you know crocodiles they're infamous for that they'll come and they'll take kids away they'll kill people that aren't careful fishermen but they've been driven to do it for millions of years whatever they can eat they eat and a lot of times when people go out and try to kill them they end up getting eaten by the same thing so pertains to dogmen as well it's like don't go out and actively hunt one it's like i know there's people that have gone out and shot them and some apparently have killed them with no photographs but that's just asking to get hurt or killed or hurt somebody else and it's just like uh, when josh turner comes on and talks about uh, a lot of those guys that had their encounters over in texas uh, i forget his name they're the one that got chased when he was on the four-wheeler and ended up getting stranded in that tree with the bull well that one chased after him but on that farm or the ranch, I should say, when you said that there's dozens of those things around, Did somebody go out trying to actively hunt one and then run into a pack of them and they think, hey, I'm going to kill this one, blah, 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 and then I'm going to have proof. And then that person ends up going missing. They're either never found or we end up having another case like the LBL where somebody stumbles across a body that's been completely torn apart or bodies, I should say. So do not actively go out and hunt them. It's like if you want to observe them, you know, be an investigator, go out, do some daytime research. If you're going to go out with more people and research, stay in a large group and try to record as much as you can. Listen for vocalizations, try to get pictures if you can, but definitely don't go out and actually try to kill them. Hey, I carry a firearm all you want to keep protected, but don't actively go out and try to kill one. That's just asking for trouble. Well, that's really good advice. I can think of a lot of hobbies that are a lot safer than trying to hunt dog men. Having said that, thanks so much for coming back on the show and updating us, Dave. You know, I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, Vic. Oh, it's been great having you back. Well, thanks again so much. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. Thanks. We'll see ya. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.